Yes, uh, let me introduce Mr. Elvis Okoth, who's from uh, uh, Kenyatta University. Uh, Mr. Okoth will be our presenter today, this afternoon, taking us through uh, skill-related physical fitness components. So I won't take much more time, and, uh, but I'll ask uh, Elvis to continue. Thank you, and welcome, Mr. Elvis. Thank you, thank you, John. Let me just uh, share my slides. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Or oh, depending on with where you are, it's, it's afternoon here in Kenya. Um, I can see we have uh, uh, people from other parts of, of the world, but um, it's afternoon here. Good afternoon. Um, I said earlier on. As said earlier on by John, my name is um, Elvis Onyango Koth. Uh, I'm a fitness practitioner, exercise and sports physiologist at uh, Kenyatta University, uh, Department of Physical Education, Exercise and Sports Science. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with John and uh, some, some people from uh, our National Local Olympic Committee a few weeks back. And uh, we got to talking, we went around the campus, Kenyatta University, and um, uh, John and his colleagues got to see what we usually do at KU in terms of fitness, in terms of uh, fitness testing, in terms of sports. So I'm going to present uh, a small topic, a small talk on fitness and performance testing in sports. So I'm going to start from the very basic, from physical activity and build it, build it all the way into fitness and then categories of fitness and the various sort of field tests that we can do uh, in, a, in a sort of in a field sort of kind of setup. Okay, so first things first, physical fitness. Uh, before we get into physical fitness, um, I want us to look into physical activity. Uh, physical activity has been defined as the physical act, as any bodily movement produced by our skeletal muscles. Uh, and of course, uh, this movement requires energy expenditure. Uh, and of course, it's activities such as uh, while working, playing, carrying out household chores, traveling and engaging in recreational pursuits. So any sort of movement uh, that is uh, any bodily movement produced by our skeletal muscles. That is what we call physical activity. That is a very, very, very broad uh, perspective of what physical activity is. Um, I'd also like to sort of look into exercise. What is exercise? Exercise is a subset of physical activity behavior that involves purposeful, you have to be purposeful, you have to be sort of willing and uh, repetitive movements with the aim of improving either your cardiorespiratory endurance, your muscular fitness, physical fitness, flexibility. So the whole aspect, the whole difference between exercise and physical activity is that exercise is purposeful and of course it has repetitive movements. So it is carried out in a planned and structured manner. And what about sports? Sports is an activity involving physical exertion and skill in which Elvis, we have lost you. Elvis, we have lost you. Logical, intellectual, or mechanical performance. And to maybe get a little bit deeper into it, I'll also want to look into sports training. Sports training is the physical, technical, intellectual, psychological, and moral preparation of an athlete by means of physical exercise. So let me just reiterate that sports training is the physical, technical, intellectual, psychological.
course, the main one is physical training. Uh, we also have technical training, considering uh, sports involves uh, a display of skills, depending on which particular discipline one is taking part in. Uh, we also have mental or intellectual training. We have psychological or emotional training. And lastly, we also have tactical training. So for the, for the scope of this particular talk that we're going to have today, we're going to mostly focus on physical training. But then again, what possible objectives can we not just us, but also our athletes, what possible objectives can our athletes or anyone who sort of engages in, let me say physical training can acquire or can get. Uh, of course, uh, one is that uh, uh, there's a development or improvement of physical condition, uh, development or improvement of technique, development or improvement of tactics, uh, mental and intellectual development. So there's a lot, there's a, Training in itself is a really sort of is a very big scope of so many things. But as I said earlier on, we're mostly going to focus on physical training. So physical training involves the development of the anatomical, physiological, and morphological aspects of the body. That is the anatomical, physiological, and morphological aspects of the body. By in this instance, anatomical, we might mean our our musculature, by physiological, the processes in which uh, the, bodies go, the body goes through not just producing energy for the various activities that we're going to go through. And of course, morphological, that is the physique as well. Um, physical fitness is the ability to perform moderate to vigorous level of physical activity without undue fatigue and uh, capability of maintaining such an ability throughout life. So this is a very, very broad sort of definition of what physical fitness is. So this means, this meaning does not satisfy everyone's need. It is or rather everyone's needs. It's very broad and also a bit sort of uh, somewhat vague. So the meaning of physical fitness can change from person to person. Of course, we are all different. And uh, we have different categories of people. Some people are fairly sedentary. They don't really participate much in physical activity, while others like uh, the athletes that we train uh, participate in physical activity and of course sports as well. So you'll find that their level of fitness is way, way higher as compared to others. So the more appropriate question to ask in this instant is physically fit for what? What are we physically fit for? If you look at our athletes, they have to be physically fit for their various disciplines. So the aims, objectives, and needs of the individual will determine the meaning of physical fitness for that particular individual, be it uh, a marathon runner. Uh, there are specific aspects of fitness that we need to look at, be it uh, uh, a wrestler or a power lifter, fitness, varies. So anyone who is involved in training and conditioning must understand the components, their definitive differences, and the training methods to succeed. So I want us to look into the two types of fitness components. We have health-related fitness components, and we also have skill-related fitness components. So as the name suggests, health-related fitness components these are components that are directly related to our health and have a very big impact on our health. The very first component I want us to look into is called cardiorespiratory endurance. And this refers to the efficiency of the heart, lungs, and associated vessels in delivering oxygen and nutrients to the cell. And of course, removing waste products from the body without undue fatigue. So if I can just simplify this a bit, your cardiorespiratory endurance uh, ideally is the support your body gives your skeletal muscles when you're engaging in repetitive sort of uh, activities such as running or swimming or, or walking or jogging or something like that. So over time, your skeletal muscles, the muscles that obviously um, 
sort of enable you to move, they need nutrients, uh, they need oxygen, and they also need a way of uh, removing waste metabolites. So for these muscles to be able to get these nutrients, for these muscles to be able to get this oxygen, and of course, for these muscles to be able to remove the waste metabolites that sort of uh, is necessary, comes with the physiological processes, uh, there are various organs that comes into play. And of course, the main, one of the big ones is the heart. We also have the lungs and of course, the circulatory system whereby blood is the medium of uh, sort of pushing nutrients and, and oxygen to the skeletal muscles. And it is also the medium of uh, pushing oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. And of course, other metabolites like lactate from our, from our blood, blood system, from, from the blood. So that is what we call cardiorespiratory system or rather cardiorespiratory endurance. So if your cardiorespiratory endurance is a little bit low, it means that your heart and your lungs are not able to effectively supply the, the nutrients and the oxygen and remove waste metabolites to your skeletal muscles. So from a scientific perspective, that is what we call cardiorespiratory endurance. Uh, we also have muscular strength. And uh, muscular strength refers to the amount of force exerted or resistance provided by a muscle or group of muscles in a single maximal and voluntary contraction. Uh, we also have muscular endurance. Of course, there's a bit of a difference here. One is strength and the other one is endurance. Um, endurance refers to the ability of a muscle or group of muscles to sustain work for an extended duration without undue fatigue. And this is usually at submaximal efforts. Next, we have flexibility, musculoskeletal, and this is a musculoskeletal function. So it refers to the possible range of motion at a joint or a group of joints. Uh, we also have percent body fat, or you can even look at it from a broad perspective where you can also call it body composition, refers to the ratio of fat to lean muscle mass in the body, the amount of fat we have in the body as compared to lean muscle mass. Uh, it is also wrongly referred to as body compositions. So, but in reality is the complete composition of everything that makes up the body, the skeletal, the muscular, the vascular, the organs, minerals, and water. Of course, in relation to the amount of fat we have in the body. This particular component is key in terms of uh, it has a very sort of direct impact when it comes to health, because ideally the more fat one has in their body, the higher the risk of uh, non-communicable diseases, hypokinetic diseases, and of course, uh, there's of course limited motion. Uh, next, we also have power. Power used to be a component of a, a skill-related physical fitness component. But nowadays, it's mostly sort of looked at as a sort of health-related physical fitness component because it is a, it is a component of, a, of, a, of strength and speed, and it is also deemed somewhat necessary. So power is the maximum force used to accomplish a task in the shortest time. So while strength is the maximum force that can be used in a single contraction, Power is proportional to the speed at which you can apply this maxim maximal force. Uh, next, I want us to look into skill-related fitness components. So skill-related fitness, fitness components are components that uh, I would say they are higher level physical fitness, or higher level physical fitness components that uh, are mostly used by uh, individuals or athletes taking part in sports depending with the discipline. Uh, for example, speed. Speed is the time taken to complete a task or rate of motion or velocity of movement. Uh, we also have balance, uh, ability to maintain equilibrium over a small base. Uh, we have agility. That is the ability of the individual to change body positions and directions rapidly. Uh, this is mostly evident in uh, probably games like uh, soccer uh, or rugby, whereby athletes are required to be able to change and switch directions rapidly. 
we have coordination. This is the ability to perform smooth, fluid and balanced motion without awkwardness, whereby we sort of, we are able to balance different aspects of, of, our, of, of our bodies to be able to achieve a specific task. Uh, lastly, we have reaction time. Uh, and this is a time taken to respond to stimulus. A good example is uh, during a penalty kick. When a soccer player kicks the penalty, the goalkeeper has to be able to have good reaction time so as to be able to, to, to adequately see where the ball is going and also try and save that ball. So that is basically an introduction into what fitness is and what uh, and the various aspects and various components of physical fitness. Uh, I want us to look into why it is important for us to be able to ascertain or assess these particular aspects of fitness. Uh, so fitness testing or assessment is used to determine various aspects of physical fitness and health. So why, why fitness testing? Why do we need to do fitness testing? Uh, firstly, we need to do fitness testing so as to be able to identify strengths and weaknesses of our current, of current performance or state of health. Um, if you have your, your players, you have to be able to constantly test them and see where they are in terms of, of, of their fitness capabilities. And uh, at least by knowing this, you're able to sort of um, come up with protocols that will be able to sort of um, improve whatever weaknesses that they are there. Uh, we fitness test so as to be able to provide feedback regarding the effectiveness of a training protocol or lifestyle modification program. For example, uh, if um, maybe soccer players have been put into a specific uh, strength and conditioning protocol, for us to be able to see whether this particular protocol is, uh, is, is effective, we have to test. Uh, we also test because uh, for us to better understand uh, self capabilities, for us to better understand how far uh, we can push ourselves or how far we can push our athletes. Uh, we test so as to be able to set goals. Uh, this is uh, incentives to improve, motivate, and also achieve. And lastly, as, uh, as coaches and, and, and uh, sports practitioners, we also test so as to be able to identify talent, uh, identify strengths and weaknesses and potential strengths and potential weaknesses. Okay, so we've looked into why we should fitness test. Uh, now that we've seen the, the reason why we should be fitness testing, uh, we have different sort of types and different kinds of fitness tests. We have uh, direct fitness tests and indirect fitness tests. So direct fitness tests, these are sort of gold standard uh, kind of tests, and these are sort of mostly lab-based tests. These are tests that we mostly do at, uh, for example, at Kenyatta University, we do at our human performance lab. And of course, we also have indirect tests. And these are tests that can be done. We also call them field tests. So these are tests that can be done uh, sort of uh, by our coaches out there in the field. Uh, they are easily, easy, easy to sort of um, execute and, um, and easy to, to implement. Uh, they don't require a lot of expense. They don't require expensive equipment. Uh, they are fairly, fairly understandable. So I am mostly going to focus on a field test so as to be able to make it easier for our coaches to be able to also do fitness testing. So before getting into that, there are some basic principles and guidelines of uh, fitness appraisals that I think is necessary for us to, to look into. So first one is a pre-test instruction. So before you test, uh, all pre-test instructions should be provided and adhere to prior to arrival of, the, of arrival of the athletes at the fitness testing facility. The following steps should be taken to ensure client safety and comfort before administering a health-related physical fitness test. So one is that we should perform informed consent process. This is very, very important. Uh, whereby 
the athlete needs to know what exactly he or she is being tested for. Uh, they need to know if there are any sort of risks, um, uh, any sort of risks, anything, maybe injuries or anything like that. They need to be adequately informed and they need to understand. Uh, we should also allow the athlete time for the individual undergoing the assessment to have all their questions adequately addressed. So we call that the informed consent process. Before you test, uh, whoever you're testing has to consent to it and has to be able to understand exactly what you're testing and how you're going to test it. Uh, there's also, we should also perform exercise pre-participation health screening. Uh, from a university perspective, uh, we have uh, many kind, we have many athletes. Uh, of course, our athletes are also students. Uh, before they engage in, in, in any sports, they have to have a health screening, which is done at our directorate of university health. Uh, so it is necessary. It is necessary, especially nowadays, uh, whereby we've seen instances whereby athletes are falling down and dying from cardiorespiratory issues. These are necessary key things that we need to consider. Uh, we should also have a complete pre-exercise evaluation including a medical history and a cardiovascular disease risk factor assessment. Um, individuals can complete a self-guided questionnaire such, a, such as a physical activity readiness questionnaire. So it is necessary for us to be able to have all this, of, have all these things in place. Um, the test organization, how do we organize the tests? So the following should be accomplished before the client or the patient or the athlete arrives at the test site. One is that we should ensure consent and screening forms, which we've already spoken about. Uh, we should have all the data recording sheets because ideally what we're looking for is data. All that should be ready. And any related testing and documents should be available in the client's file and available for tests administration. Uh, we should also calibrate all the equipment that we're going to use. We should calibrate all the equipment that we're going to use. So for example, if we're going to use a treadmill or if we're going to use uh, any, any sort of equipment, maybe a bench press or whatever it is, weighing scale, the stadiometer, we should make sure they are properly calibrated. When multiple tests are to be administered, the test, the organization of the testing session can be very important. So depending on what physical fitness components are to be evaluated. So we need to be able to consider how we are going to do this test and the order in which these tests are going to be done. So resting measurements such as heart rate, blood pressure, height, weight, and body composition should be obtained fast. That goes without saying. Uh, and also an optimal testing order for multiple health related components of fitness. These are things like cardiorespiratory endurance and muscular fitness and flexibility has not been established, but sufficient time should be allowed for heart rate and blood pressure to return to baseline between tests conducted serially. For example, if, you're, if you're, you've just done maybe muscular endurance tests, you need to be able to give uh, the athletes a little bit more, a little bit of time for them to recover before you move to the next test. And then test procedures, procedures should be organized to follow in sequence without stressing the same muscle group repeatedly. To ensure reliability, the chosen order should be followed on subsequent testing sessions. So because certain medications such as beta blockers lower heart rate, uh, and of course they will affect some physical fitness test results, use of these medications should be noted. And I think that's why it's also very important for us to have a physical activity readiness questionnaire and also just a medical history questionnaire. We should be able to have this and administer this to our athletes. It's necessary for us to pretty much know all this for us to be able to safeguard our athletes. Test environment. Environment is important for test validity and reliability. Uh, test anxiety, emotions, uh, room temperature, ventilation should be controlled as much as possible. But then again, 
most of the tests that we're going to be looking at are mostly field tests. So ideally, it's just making sure that uh, whatever environment we have is conducive for whatever sort of test we're going to, to be implementing. To minimize subject anxiety, sometimes our athletes can be anxious. The test procedures should be explained adequately and should not be rushed. And the test environment should be quiet and private. The room should be equipped with a comfortable seat and or examination table. That is if, for example, you're doing things like blood pressure and heart rate, the room, the room should be adequate. And of course, the demeanor of the personnel who's sort of collecting this particular data should also be relaxed so as to inspire confidence uh, to the athletes. The exercise professional should be familiar with the emergency response plan in case in case of an emergency, because we, we all know, and it goes without saying that fitness testing has some, a bit of a risk to it. And uh, of course, we need to try and try as much as possible to mitigate this risk. And, and we can do this by having an emergency response plan. For example, if you want to test cardiorespiratory endurance and you've decided you want to maybe do uh, maybe a shuttle run grip test or something like that, it is a sub-maximal exercise, but it's still, it will still push the particular sort of athletes. So we need to have an emergency plan in place. For example, should someone maybe feel dizzy after finishing or after, uh, after finishing their test, uh, we need to be able to have first aiders in place and uh, maybe people who can assist in case such an emergency occurs. We should note that the risks of health-related physical fitness testing may outweigh the potential benefits for some individuals. Although some appraisals such as body composition pose very little risks, others such as cardiorespiratory endurance, uh, of course, that, that require physical exertion may have a bit of a higher risk. And that is why it is important for us to have, uh, maybe we should look at um, our, our athletes' uh, medical history and also have them have rather go through a cardiovascular health check before sort of doing all this. Uh, the very first order of tests, the very first order of tests first uh, that we usually start with is anthropometric tests. Uh, anthropometric measurements are a series of quantitative measurements of the muscle, the bone, adipose tissues used to assess the composition of the body. So ideally, when your athletes are coming in, uh, let's say, for example, maybe it's a, it's a pre-season, maybe pre-season test before you guys start your season. So when they come in, the first thing you have to do, you need to take their height, you need to take their weight. Uh, of course, we also have other kinds of uh, anthropometric tests that we can do, and these are mostly body composition tests. Uh, we can do skin fold tests. We can do waist, waist to hip ratio tests, body mass index tests. So the core elements of anthropometry are height, weight, body mass index, body circumferences, and skin fold thickness. So these measurements are important because they represent diagnostic criteria for obesity, which significantly increases the risk of conditions such as cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and of course, diabetes. So how do we get this height? So for us to be able to measure height, of course, we require some materials. Uh, from a very basic perspective, we can just use a measuring tape. And of course, uh, okay. So procedure, so athletes should stand against a wall without shoes. So whenever we're measuring for height, we do not obviously wear shoes. Uh, heels, buttocks, shoulders, and back on the head are all in contact with the wall. Uh, and of course, uh, we should make sure that the bending the measuring tape to 90 degrees at a right angle with the wall at the highest point of the head or not hair. So if we do not have a stadiometer, we can use a measuring tape. Um, ideally, if you can look at uh, the picture 
uh, under anthropometric tests. You can look at the picture on the left. Uh, the particular individual is actually, uh, his height is being measured using a stud geometer. And you can also see the individual also stepping on the scale, and that is his weight being taken. So for weight, uh, we mostly need a scale, uh, and we mostly do measure in kilograms, depending on which part of the world. Others measure in pounds, but in, in Kenya here, we mostly do use kilograms. Apart from doing that, uh, of course, with our height and our weight, we can be able to ascertain BMI. We can also uh, measure waist to hip ratio. But from an uh, athlete's perspective, uh, waist to hip ratio might not necessarily be the best kind of tests we can use. So it will not necessarily give us an accurate sort of percentage body fat reading. So before getting into that, I want us to get into cardiorespiratory endurance tests. Uh, and from that, you can see the kind of picture we have here. We have someone in a lab assessing uh, a particular athlete. And this is what we call a clinical sort of kind of testing. And this is what we were calling direct testing. This is a VO2 max testing. This is something that we do in a lab setup. But then again, this kind of setup is very, very expensive and not everyone has the necessary equipment to be able to do this. So we have other alternative tests that we can use, especially in a field setup. So the aerobic capacity is the ability of the heart and lungs to provide the body with oxygen for exercise. And of course, we've said that maximal tests are the gold standards of fitness testing. So the above is, is the gold standard and it is the most accurate. Uh, Submaximal tests, uh, subjects are not taken to the maximal limits, uh, and such tests include the multi-stage bleed test and the Cooper test. So I want us to start with the 20 meters multi-stage. Sorry, I didn't realize it was muted. So let me just go back a bit. Um, so we were talking about height and weight as uh, some of the anthropometric tests that we can do. Uh, and it's a fairly, fairly simple. Um, and of course, we also looked into body mass index. Once you have the height and the weight, you can be able to ascertain BMI. And uh, we also have waist to hip ratio, which you only need a tape measure to be able to, to ascertain. Um, and for body composition, we also looked into skin fold thickness, which we are not going to look into considering not everyone has the necessary equipment to be able to, to, to use skin folds, but we're going to look into something we call predicting percentage body fat using GAT measurements. Uh, after that, we went into cardiorespiratory endurance. And uh, we saw that the picture in place here is, uh, this is actually in a lab setup. This particular, you can see uh, someone in a lab uh, with an athlete with very fancy equipment trying to ascertain cardiorespiratory endurance. So this is VO2 max testing. And uh, ideally, it is a maximal test. And it is the gold standard for cardiorespiratory endurance. And as we've said that these are very ex expensive equipment, not everyone has this and not everyone is able to sort of do this. So we also have submaximal tests, whereby subjects are not taken to the maximal limits. Such tests include uh, the 20 meter multi-stage bleed test and the Cooper test. So we're going to look into the 20 meter or rather 20 meter multi-stage shuttle run bleed test. And for this we've said, ideally we don't really need that much. We just need marking cones. Of course, a fairly flat surface marking cones. Uh, we need to measure out 20 meters in between the cones we need a beep test audio recording, uh, of course, uh, audio player and recording sheets. So before the test, we need to be able to explain the procedures to the athletes, what is going on, what they need to do. Just a minute. Okay, so we were talking about a 20 meter shuttle run bleep test. Um, 
So I said earlier on, it's a fairly sort of simple uh, way of testing cardiorespiratory endurance. We just need marking cones, uh, 20 meter measuring tape, beep test audio recording, of course, an audio player and some recording sheets. Uh, before obviously conducting the test, you need to be able to explain to the athletes exactly what is going on and how exactly they should be able to do the particular tests. Uh, procedure, uh, this test in, involves continuous running between two lines, 20 meters apart, in time to, of course, with while following the recorded beeps. Uh, for this reason, this test is often called a beep or bleep test. So ideally, it is, uh, I wouldn't say it's a maximal test, it's a sub-maximal test, but ideally it's one of the most effective ways of testing cardiorespiratory endurance in a, in a field setup. So this particular test have, has several levels and shuttles. So whatever we're going to get in terms of scoring is whereby, uh, of course, the athlete is encouraged to try and sort of uh, run for as long as possible. And the point at which they are exhausted and they cannot run anymore, uh, we will collect the level and the shuttle. So each level has several shuttles. So as we start, you'll find that level one has uh, about uh, maybe 10 shuttles, level two, like that, like that. So for example, if an athlete leaves, or maybe um, the athlete has, has, um, has managed to leave the test at probably level two, shuttle three, that is what we're going to note. And we're going to use that particular data to be able to either calculate their VO2 max, that is, VO2 max is your cardiorespiratory endurance, or we can still use that particular level and shuttle, still using normative data, we can still be able to ascertain exactly how, uh, in terms of fitness, how fit is this particular athlete in terms of cardiorespiratory endurance. So we also have a Cooper 12 minute run walk test. So ideally, this is one of the easiest tests that uh, we can use for cardiorespiratory endurance in a field setup. Um, ideally, all is required here is just uh, maybe a whistle, a stopwatch, and of course, a running track. A running track whereby we have an idea of the distances being covered. So this is a run-walk test whereby the, the athlete is allowed to either run or walk over a particular sort of um, over a particular duration of time, and this is 12 minutes. So, for example, if you have an access, you have access to a 400 meter running track. Uh, of course, we will try and we will tell the athlete you have 12 minutes to cover as much distance as possible, and at the end of the 12 minutes, we'll, the distance that they have covered is what we are going to use. To, to be able to ascertain their cardiorespiratory endurance. Of course, we can also use this data to be able to calculate their VO2 max as well. So next we have percentage body fat. And uh, so measuring percentage body fat percentage is an easy method of discovering uh, correct body weight and composition. So of course we have various ways. We have simple indices of body fatness and simple indices of body fatness are things like BMI and uh, waist to hip ratios. These are some of the things that we spoke about earlier on. Apart from that, we have higher levels of uh, assessments of body fatness. Uh, we have skin fold thickness, which we're not going to use because, uh, which we're not going to talk about because most people don't have skin fold calipers and might not necessarily know which particular sites to be able to, to, to assess. So beneath the skin is a layer of subcutaneous fat and a percentage of to total body fat can be uh, measured by taking gut measurements at selected points on the body with the measuring tape. So we're going to use, we're going to be able to use, I'm going to show you guys how to calculate percentage body fat using gut measurements. So we're going to look at several sites within the body and we're going to measure the gut of those sites. And we're going to use that to get, or rather to ascertain percentage body fat. Um, you can see I have a table here showing age, gender, 
site A, site B, and site C. So if your athlete is between the ages of 18 to 26 uh, and they are male, site A is right upper arm, site B is abdomen, and site C is right forearm. If they are female, site A is abdomen, site B is right thigh, and uh, site C is right forearm. So it changes like that. Um, and as you can see, there's also this diagram showing where exactly site A is, where exactly site B is, site C, site B, site E, and site, site F. So those are the various sites that we will measure using a measuring tape. Uh, and of course, once we get these measurements, we are able to ascertain using uh, online calculators, we are able to ascertain to an accurate of about plus or minus 2.5% to be able to ascertain their percentage body fat. So this will tell us exactly uh, the level of uh, percentage body fat or rather in terms of percentage body fat where our athletes are. Uh, next, we will have muscular strength, muscular strength. And of course, uh, this one is a little bit difficult. This one, uh, we can either have, we either need to have a uh, hand grip dynamometer or back strength dynamometer, or if not, if uh, our particular athletes have access to a gym, then we can use what we call a one RM bench press test one repetition maximum. So one repetition maximum is the maximum amount of uh, weight one can sort of lift for one rep. Uh, so of course there are processes to that. Uh, and the purpose of this is to measure maximum strength of the chest. You can either do a one RM bench press test or even a squat. So the purpose of this is to test how strong our athletes are. Of course, the equipment needed here is just a bench, a, of course, a bench press with some weights. Uh, if it is a, if it's a one RM squat, then of course we need a squat rack with some weights. So the procedure the subject should perform, of course, adequate warm up. It's very, very, very important for our athletes to warm up before we do any sort of fitness testing. The, sub, the subject should then rest for two to four minutes then perform the one rep max attempt with proper technique. The scoring in this instance is the maximum weight lifted. Uh, and of course, to standardize the score, it may be used to, to calculate a score proportional to the person's body weight. So we need to also adjust for their body weight. How about muscular endurance? Muscular endurance is a little bit different from muscular strength, whereby um, muscular endurance is how long your particular muscle, a particular muscle can endure a particular sort of task. Uh, in this instance, we will employ the 60 seconds timed push-up fitness test. So this can be easily replicated anywhere. So the push-up fitness test measures upper body strength and endurance. Of course, possible equipment that we might need in this instance, uh, like a mat and a stop watch. And of course, the, 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 the objective here is to try and do as many push-ups as possible uh, within a period of 60 seconds. Uh, procedure, we need to be able to ascertain that our athletes are executing a standard push-up. And we do this by, of course, having an assistant, someone who's counting for the athlete, they place their fist down on the ground and ideally the athlete is supposed to go all the way down and have his chest, his or her chest, touch the particular fist of uh, the assistant. So that is how, that, that is one repetition of a push-up. So scoring here is the maximum number of push-ups that this particular athlete will be able to do in a period of 60 seconds. We can also, for the same, we can also do either a pull-up or chin-up tests. So for the men, for, the, for, for men, we can, this can be a pull-up or chin-up. For ladies, it can be a hanging, you, you can just, it's called, we, we, hang, we call it a hanging lift. You can just, they can just hang and then we see how long they last. So the pull-up test is widely used as a measure of um, upper body strength. 
um, upper body endurance. Participants must grab an overhead bar and pull up the body to, so that the chin raises above the bar, then return to arms fully extended position. Of course, the purpose is to test your muscular strength and endurance. So this is fairly simple. Uh, I'm sure um, it's easier for athletes to get an horizontal overhead bar. So this can be easily replicated by anyone out there. Uh, for flexibility, we have different sort of modes and different sort of uh, kinds of flexibility. For health-related physical fitness, we mostly look at low back flexibility, but then again, we also have shoulder elevation flexibility, we have uh, knee flexibility, and this one will take us to sort of a little bit more complex modes of assessing uh, flexibility. But the most, the simplest way of assessing flexibility is actually the seat and reach flexibility test. Uh, from the picture, you can see the particular individual is actually doing a seat, seat and reach flexibility test. So it involves sitting down, having uh, legs flat on the ground, knees down, and reaching out as far as possible. So the score that we'll have gotten in this particular instance, we'll cross-reference it with uh, normative data. Uh, and of course, we'll be able to see how good or not so good our low back flexibility is. Next, we have power. And from this, you can see from the picture, we can see there's a lady uh, standing and reaching out. Uh, so that is her sort of standing height baseline. And now from that, she's squatting down and trying to jump up as high as possible. So the distance that we're going to measure is, uh, that is uh, the distance from her standing height to her jumping height. Uh, and so this is uh, what we call the vertical jump test. And this is what we use to ascertain for power. So this test is used um, uh, our explosive leg power. And of course, all that is needed is just a high wall, such as uh, the one outside of a building and a bit of a room so that one can jump and land safely. And of course, this one, we start by standing aside onto a wall and of course, reach up as high as one can with hand closest to the wall. Of course, we make note of how high you can reach. And then of course, we jump up to try and get a jumping height. Of course, to aid the process, uh, if you can have maybe a chalk or something like that. So you jump with the chalk and mark where, or rather the athlete jumps with the chalk and marks the point at which uh, they reach after jumping. That is their maximum jumping height. And so we will be able to measure that distance. And that is what we use to ascertain their vertical uh, jump, or rather their, their sort of leg power. So you can see we have various norms here uh, from excellent all the way down to poor. And of course, we have male measurements, uh, female measurements as well. Uh, so whatever measurements that we'll take, we will cross-reference it with the data, with the normative data that we have here. And this will be able to tell us in terms of uh, leg power, this is where our athletes are. For example, if you're a basketball coach, for example, if you're a football coach, these are some of the necessary requirements for, for our athletes. So these are some of the tests that are very, very important and need to be, need to be sort of, uh, uh, our athletes need to be taken through. Uh, next, we have speed. So we have various ways of assessing speed from a field perspective, of course, uh, what most people do is what we call the 30 meter sprint. And ideally from the 30 meter sprint, um, an athlete sort of uh, runs from uh, point A to point B, which is about 30 meters. And of course, using a stopwatch, we're trying to ascertain how much or how fast they can cover the 30 meter sprint. But then again, I also want us to talk about the flying 30 meter sprint test. So this is different from the 30 meter sprint test, which is measured from the blocks or from a standing start. So with a 30 meter running start, this test can measure maximum running speed. 
So this test is commonly used by track and field coaches as part of speed training. So it's like our athletes have a bit of a 30 meter head start to start running. And of course, the objective is to try and be as fast as possible. Purpose of this, or rather the aim of this test is to determine maximum running speed. Of course, the equipment needed here, a measuring tape, a marked track, a stopwatch, or if you don't have a stopwatch, you can have timing gates, but I think it's easier to have a stopwatch, uh, cone markers, flat and clear surface of at least um, 80 meters. Um, so ideally, it's a fairly easy test to, to do. Uh, of course, before the test, you should be able to explain the test procedures to the, sub to the subjects, the athletes, perform screening of health risks, and obtain informed consent. Of course, the athletes have to have warmed up before doing this. And of course, the procedure is uh, setting, up, setting up cones at 0, 30 meters, and 60 meters. So for the results, two trials are allowed, and the best time is recorded to the nearest two decimal places. And of course, we will cross-reference this with the, with the normative data that is out there. The target population for this particular test are sprinters, uh, team sport athletes, such as soccer players, uh, rugby players, and any other sport in which running speed is important. Uh, next, we have reaction time. Reaction time. And of course, the objective of, of this particular test, this particular test is called a ruler drop test. Uh, the objective of this ruler drop test is to assess reaction time. It is the most basic test we can use uh, to assess reaction time. Of course, we have so many other tests. We have other computer-based tests that we can use, but in a field sort of kind of setup, uh, a ruler drop test is the most basic test we can use. And ideally, what is needed here is just a meter rule and uh, someone to assist. And ideally, uh, the ruler is held up by the assistant between the outstretched finger and the thumb. And of course, once the assistant drops the ruler, uh, we're going to assess the point at which the athlete will catch that ruler. Uh, of course, the ruler starts from zero all the way up to 30 centimeters, and uh, we're going to, to assess and look at the point at which the athlete will catch the ruler, and we will use that, cross-reference it with our norms, and be able to ascertain our athlete's reaction time. So it's a fairly, fairly basic mode of assessing reaction time. Nowadays, we have a click reaction time, which is a an, an online computer-based reaction time test that we can also use for this. Uh, agility. So for us to be able to test agility, and agility is the rate at which one we can be able to sort of change direction. This is very, very important in, uh, I would say, team sports and also some of uh, individual sports. Uh, so we're going to use an Illinois agility test. And uh, Illinois agility test is one of the very many tests that can be used to test for agility. So ideally, all is required is a 10 meter by 5 meter track. Of course, we need uh, about 10 marking cones. The athlete starts from, uh, from a lying position. And once the whistle is blown, they stand up and run the course. The course is fairly complicated. So we need to be able to explain this to the athletes before before explain it. And maybe if you can actually even um, physically demonstrate, uh, it's better if we do this so, so as for them to be able to understand exactly what is being assessed here. So Elvis. the course layout, the length, the length of the course is 10 meters and the width is five meters. Uh, of course, we need cones, and in between the cones is 3.3 uh, meters. So I've linked a video sort of showing how exactly the particular sort of uh, test is undertaken. It is fairly complex, so it needs to be practiced before actually doing the particular test. So it is a simple test to administer, requiring minimal equipment. 
and also players' ability to turn in different directions and at different angles are tested. Uh, of course, the disadvantage is the choice of footwear. If uh, athletes are not wearing good footwear, then it might uh, impair their performance. Excuse. Yes. Uh, there's a, there's a, a pop-up message at the bottom. Can you hide it? It's kind of blurring. You can see there's an option to hide. Uh, yes. And the, uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Okay. So this test does not distinguish between left and right turning ability. The test often takes longer than 15 seconds, at which stage fatigue will begin to play. So ideally, this one needs a little bit of, a little bit of, a bit of practice before actually um, executing it. But ideally, it is the best way of assessing uh, agility in a field setup. Next, we have coordination. And a good uh, test for this uh, we have is called the alternate hand wall toss test. And this is a test of, of hand-eye coordination where participants throw a ball against a wall from one hand and in an up, sort of underarm action and attempt to catch it with the opposite hand. The purpose is to measure hand-eye coordination. Of course, the equipment needed here in this instance is a tennis ball, uh, smooth and solid wall, marking tape, stopwatch. So of course we need to explain everything to the athletes before, before them executing the tests. Uh, the procedure is that a line is placed on the ground a certain distance from the wall. That is either two meters or three feet. The person stands behind the line and facing the wall. The ball is thrown from one hand in an underarm action against the wall and attempted to be caught with the opposite hand. The ball is then thrown back against the wall and caught with the initial hand. The test can continue for a nominated number of attempts or for a set period of time. That's about 30 seconds. And of course, by adding the constraint of a set of time period, you can also add the factor of working and under pressure. So for scoring, the table lists general ratings uh, for the wall toss test based on the score of the number of successful catches in a 30 second period. So for a period of 30 seconds, if you're able to catch uh, more than 35 times, that means your coordination is, hand-eye coordination is excellent. If you're able to catch maybe 30 or 35, 30 to 35 times, that means your hand-eye coordination is good. Anything from 20 to 29 is average, 15 to 19 is fair, and anything below 15 is, Poor. So we also have balance. Uh, and of course, for balance, we're going to look at it from two perspectives, from a static perspective and also from a walking perspective. So for, for a standing sort of static perspective, we can, we can use something we call the stock balance test. Uh, this requires the person to stand on one leg and up on the ball of their foot for as long as possible. And it is somewhat similar to the flamingo balance test. Uh, it's a bit different as it requires the subject to balance on a board, but this one you're just on a flat surface, but up on the balls of your foot. So the purpose is to assess whole body balance ability. Equipment required here is just a flat non-slip surface, stopwatch, paper, and pencil. Uh, of course, for the pretest, we need to be able to explain and probably even demonstrate uh, to the athletes exactly how this particular test is conducted. Uh, of course, they're supposed to remove their shoes, uh, place their hands on the hips, then position them non-supporting foot against the inside knee of the supporting foot. Uh, the hands should come off the hips, supporting foot should swivel or move in any direction and the non-supporting foot loses contact with the knee. So the heel of the supporting foot should touch the floor. So how do we score? The total time in seconds is recorded. Uh, the score is the best of three attempts. And uh, as seen in the table below, if uh, one can stay in that position for more than 50 seconds, that is an excellent rating. Anything between 40 to 50 is good. Uh, anything between 25 to 39 is average. 
10 to 24 is fair and uh, anything below 10 is poor. This is the amount of sort of time duration one can manage to stay in that position. We also have a beam walk balance test. It's beam walk balance test. This is a test of whole body balance. Uh, of course, the participants are required to walk the length of the beam and back within 30 seconds. The purpose is to assess active balance. Remember the first one we looked at static balance and this is active balance. So through the ability to balance while walking along uh, an elevated beam. Of course, equipment required here is just an elevated beam or cab that is approximately four inches wide and 20 sort of feet long. And of course, we also need a stopwatch. For the pretest, we just need to explain this to the athletes and possibly even demonstrate. Procedure, the participants has 30 seconds to walk the entire length of the beam and back. The participants will start at one end and step onto the beam and walk the length of the other end. They should make a 180 degree turn and return back to the starting point. So one fall off the beam will be allowed. If the applicant's feet touch the ground before they touch or they touch across the finish line, this continue constitutes a fall. Once participants have stepped up onto the beam, they may not step off for any reason until the test is completed. So how do we score this? Participants may be given two attempts to complete the beam walk, and this is a pass or fail test. So this is a, a, a description, a picture, the illustration of ideally how one is walking along the beam, and you can see the particular individual is uh, struggling a bit. So it's an assessment of uh, of dynamic flexibility. So that is my presentation. Um, I hope we've uh, we've uh, I hope we've enjoyed the presentation, and uh, um, I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elvis. And as you said, uh, anybody with any question? Any anyone with any question for El Elvis in terms of tests? Or if you would want to ask for a particular okay, uh, ask for a particular spot. Rather, what would best work for a particular spot? or your spot? I have a question. Yes, Harrison. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that you have a human performance lab at state. And uh, as a Kenya University, and some of these tests are really important for at least for my young athletes. Sorry, Harrison, I I'm can't hear you well. I'm saying, you, you mentioned you have a human performance test lab at KU, Kenyatta University. Is it accessible? Yes. Or you're asking if uh, the human's performance, the human performance lab is accessible to, to, to outside athletes and, uh, and professional, yes. Um, we are conducting fitness tests and uh, fitness facilitation um, activities that are, uh, at the human at our human performance lab of course uh depending on the number of people and the kind of tests that uh, you want us to to execute uh it is available of course at a small fee at what age would you recommend the test to be conducted because our junior athletes quite missing losing out on a lot because they can't compete globally if uh, our coaches don't have access to such kind of information Okay, you're asking at what age would I recommend uh, fitness testing? Um, yes. If you look at, um, at uh, I would say the normative data that we have there, most of the normative data actually ranges from around 16 going up. 
Um, so people from around the age of 16 going upwards are allowed to be able to be tested. But from below that, we can't really test per se, considering we will not necessarily have uh, anything to cross-reference it with. And of course, as I said earlier on, there are some tests that are fairly uh, maximal and might be maybe a bit too much for these younger athletes. But of course, uh, from 16 going upwards, we can test. Okay, my last question, my last sorry. Question. Uh, are people a special population for these tests? Say for Paralympics? Oh, sorry? Like, are people in special population considered in these tests? Okay, you're asking about uh, people in a special, uh, special population, whether they can be tested. Of course, they can be tested. We have specific norms uh, from adapted physical education for our special population. Of course, we don't have a lot of it. We have, it's fairly limited, but we can test and we have specific tests for uh, uh, our special athletes as well. Okay, thank you so much. Hello. Karibu. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, um, I wanted to ask a question. A question about um, yes. um, a question about um, on weightlifting issue. If we want to test the musculars and weightlifting training, how do you do test for the for the athlete for the athlete also in weightlifting? How? What can we do for the test of the athlete in weightlifting? Thank you. So you're asking about weightlifting, and sorry, I didn't get quite that. What exactly about weightlifting do you want to test? In test for them. What kind of test can we do for weightlifting? Oh, what kind of tests we can do for weightlifting? So. Yes. Earlier on, we were one of the things that we looked into was mm. uh, muscular strength testing. Muscular of course, strength. we have various ways of um, yes, various ways of testing for muscular strength. Uh, yeah. I only sort of pre presented something on uh, bench press. That is for your pectoral muscles, your upper yeah. body strength. Uh, upper body. We can also do a one repetition maximum. One repetition maximum. Uh, squat tests. We can also do one repetition maximum deadlift tests. So these are the various sort of key sort of events in weightlifting that we can test. We can do a squat, we can do a bench press, we can do a deadlift. We, we are able to sort of assess all this and we have the necessary norms to be able to see where our athletes are and of course be able to work on improving uh, our the various sort of weights that we are lifting. So of course with weight lifting we have quite a number of tests that we can we can use. Okay, thank you. And also and muscular it's... endurance, the repetitions. So for muscular endurance, um, there's one thing I did not present and that is uh, your abdominal muscular endurance. So when we're looking at muscular endurance, we look at uh, we can, we can look at the upper body. We also look at the, at the abdominal, whereby uh, the simplest way of assessing abdominal muscular endurance is, um, is through a 60-second sit-up test. So for a period of 60 seconds, you're supposed to do as many sit-ups as possible. That is a fairly easy way of, being, of assessing your abdominal endurance. Uh, for your upper body endurance is a push-up, a press-up, how many press-ups can your athletes do in 60 seconds? Of course, depending on their gender and age, we're able to see where they are. Um, if maybe our athletes are not so good at push-ups, they can also do pull-ups. If maybe we have uh, lady athletes who are maybe are not so good at pull-ups as well, they can do sort of um, a hanging lift and we, we are able to see for how long they can hang in that particular sort of bar that can also be used to assess their upper body muscular endurance. 
Hello, Elvis. Can you hear me? Yes, Kyle. How are you? Yeah. Yes, I can how are hear you. you? Doing? Good to see you. Thank you. That's a wonderful presentation. I'm doing very, good. How are you? I'm good. That was very detailed and very thorough on 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 testing. I think so many coaches. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so many coaches, and I was guilty myself of not doing so much testing. You know, that's so important to uh, monitor the athletes and their progress. And I think we, we forget all the tests that can be used. And I know you talked about the vertical jump, which is a good test for the weightlifters. The weightlifters use the vertical jump because it is a power sport and oftentimes don't have to do the heavy lifts for the testing. You know, the, the vertical jump that you mentioned is a very good test for uh, Coach Johnson was asking for uh, weightlifters. And I know sometimes, and you may comment on this, the weightlifters will do both uh, a static jump and a counter movement jump, and then sometimes include formulas uh, with, with body weight for power output. So, but the, yeah, the vertical jump that you mentioned is an outstanding test for weightlifters. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for that. Uh, yes, as, as mentioned earlier on, we looked it into vertical jump. And ideally, uh, it, 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 it varies. Most of the time, we usually sort of employ a counter movement jump. Uh, and of course, we keep it standard across the board. We have different norms from a static for, we have ones for static jump, and we have uh, norms for counter movement jumps, whereby we sort of use our hands to be able to propel ourselves up. So we have different norms for, for the same. So depending with what the coach might deem necessary, we have norms for both. So we can actually sort of consider both. Thank you very much. Harrison, thank you. Harrison is asking what is counter movement? Um, Harrison counter movement is basically where we use our hands. We call it somewhat of a, it's a blocking movement that helps our body to be able to propel ourselves upward. So it can either be, you can either swing your hands up and jump up, or you can just have your hands static by your side and just jump up. So that is what Kyle was uh, talking about. So Elvis, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we have different uh, coaches from different sports here. And um, sure. maybe you could probably elaborate why it's important to have uh, some of these tests, not even in the lab, but uh, just uh, uh, out there in the field. Okay. So as said earlier on, um, in each and every sort of different discipline of sports, we need to be able to test. We need to be able to see in terms of physical fitness, because we said that... Um, we have training is broad and we have uh, different kinds of training, but the training that we're talking about today is physical training. And of course, if there's anyone who engages in sport, any sport, be it athletics, be it uh, ball games, be it uh, power games, be it whatever it is, uh, there's some element of physicality to it. Uh, that element of physicality is constantly changing depending with how active your athlete is uh, during maybe in season or off season or post season, it keeps on changing. And of course, for your athletes to be able to compete with other athletes, they need to be in top shape. For you to be able to make sure that your athlete is in top shape, you need to be able to assess and evaluate uh, their fitness. Where are they? Uh, for example, if your your athlete is, uh, I would say maybe a power lifter or a weight lifter, you need to be able to assess uh, how much weight can they lift. You need to be able to assess, um, for example, if, they're a, if he or she is a marathon runner, what is their cardiorespiratory endurance? What is their running time? So as to be able to train effectively and so as to be able to come up with protocols that will help them achieve their goals. 
Belinda, you've uh, raised your hand. Yes, I've raised my hand. Yeah, I've raised my hand. Uh, I wanted to ask about yes, muscular please. endurance. You've said that men, they can do, they can do pull up. What about the ladies? Uh, men can do pull up and for the ladies, we can do a hanging lift, whereby still on the same, same pull up, uh, instead of ladies lifting themselves up, they just uh -huh. hang. And uh, we have norms for that. We have normative data for that. And uh, ideally, the objective to see, is to see how long can they hold that position. So that is a good alternative for, for our ladies. Okay, just hanging, hanging up, not pulling anything, not pulling your legs, not pulling. You just yes, hang just up. Hanging, yes. Okay, okay. If you can't, if just you can't hanging, pull up yes. yourself. Just hanging. Okay. <laughs> There's no need for ladies. Some some can do that, but for those ones who can't, uh, we have that. We it's, it's, a, it's actually a standard reliable test that we use sometimes for our ladies for assessing upper body muscular muscular endurance. Uh, and, and since it, it, you, it is stated that it is 60 seconds, so while testing that lady, the lady will hang up for 60 seconds only. Now what is the test of the lady? No, no, not necessarily. So what happens in, in this particular one? Earlier on, we were talking about a pull-up and, uh, and the chin-up. And the thing about a pull-up and a chin-up is the objective is for you to do as many pull-ups or chin-ups as possible in a 60 seconds duration. But then again, when it comes to a hanging lift for ladies, yes. Uh, yes. we want to see for how long, for how long can these ladies hang? And that is what, that is the score that we need. And that is what we're going to use okay. to assess okay. their muscle. Now we will, upper body rely, we will not rely the 60 seconds. It's for how long? Okay, thank you. No, no, for that particular one, for that variation, no. But for if you have male athletes uh, or even lady athletes who can still do a pull up and they are good at it, they can they can focus on the other one for sixty seconds. But the hanging hanging lift is just a variation. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Karibu. Any more questions for Elvis? Comments. Yeah, I want to thank you again, Elvis. That was wonderful. So detailed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Any other comments? Uh, we'll share Elvis' contacts in case you need to talk to him later. I've seen someone was asking about uh, the Human Performance Lab and uh, and our mm -hmm. course and all that. Um, you can just share my contacts. Uh, they'll just contact me and then I will get in touch with the details. Okay. If there's no any questions or concerns for Elvis, then I would uh, request that we stop there. Of course, we'll share his contact in the group. Whoever would want to reach out to him uh, can as well do that hello 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 i have a question yeah there's someone who has a question yes. Yes. i have a question go on i know i i, I know uh, and Elvis has already said that um we can do uh a bench press for a weekly test and then um, other tests like that for weekly test. but what about cooper test please is it possible to do Cooper test? Because I know that the Cooper test is for mostly mostly footballers use Cooper test to test their endurance and their strength and their speed. But in weightlifting, if you want to test the their 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 speed or their their, their, their their endurance, how can we do the test for them also? Okay, so you're asking you asking about the Cooper test and uh so the Cooper test is a cardiorespiratory endurance test. 
And um, ideally, yes, it is uh, mostly used by athletes for testing cardiorespiratory endurance. It's one of the tests that we use, but um, I would say the most popular one that uh, we mostly use, especially for, for footballers, is a shuttle run bleep test. Uh, for rugby athletes, we have the yo-yo intermittent test. So we have different tests depending on the sort of kind of discipline that, uh, that we engage in. You know, uh, I'll give you an example of rugby. It has a start-stop sort of nature. So uh, a Cooper test might not necessarily be the best one, but the best one would be a yo-yo intermittent test or even shuttle run bleep test. Uh, yes, we do use a Cooper test, but um, from my experience, we mostly use Cooper tests uh, we don't really use it for sort of high level athletes. For high level athletes, we use shuttle run bleep test or, or even um, a VO2 peak test in a lab setup. Uh, Fanny has a question. Even saying it's though out of topic. Yes, Fanny. Hi. Hi. My question is about flexibility. Uh, personally, I've been having yes. a hip injury since 2019. And at first, the, mm -hmm. at the physiotherapist thought that uh, maybe it is because of the cyst I had. So they were expecting mm -hmm. by the end, by the time I have been the cyst have been removed after the operation, everything will be okay. But till today, I still have that injury. So what can I do about it? Because sometimes when I walk, personally, I won't realize I'm limping, but someone will tell me I'm limping. So I don't okay. know what is the main, main cause. So when we are when we are looking at injury, especially from a sort of a mobility sort of kind of perspective, uh, the various various things that we look at. One of them is pain. Um, are you feeling pain, Fanis? Are you in pain when when you're walking? Yes. Uh, before I was in, in pain. pain. Okay. Yeah. Just a minute. Douglas, so, just a minute. Douglas, Mr. Locho. Yeah. Where are you share? Is this part of the question you want to ask? No, You're no. Sharing. You are sharing. You are sharing something on the screen. Let me see. Okay, now you can go on, Elvis. So yeah, so we we usually look at it from various perspectives. If you look at um, um, joint flexibility and uh, kinds of injuries, uh, the very first thing that we look at is pain. If you're feeling pain, that means that uh, the particular injury is, is particular, is still there. If your range of motion is impaired, meaning uh, the level at which you're able to sort of move your joint is, uh, is somewhat impaired. That means we're still injured. Um, so if the pain, you say that initially the pain was there, but it is no longer there, that means that, of course, there's some level of uh, recovery. So after such kind of, uh, I would say, an operation, of course, the level of fitness was a bit impaired. So, But since there's no pain, that means there's recovery. The only thing that is uh, so, sort of uh, remaining is the aspect of flexibility, whereby uh, are you engaging in the necessary sort of flexibility and mobility exercises that can help to, to open up the hip? Um, I don't know if you're engaging in those exercises. And another thing is also, it might also be psychological, whereby uh, you don't see yourself limping, but someone tells you that you're limping. That means uh, subconsciously you're favoring that side. Fanis. Uh, the problem is when I, re when I started resuming my training, 
that is when again I start feel, I start I started to feel the pain. But right now it is on one side, on my left side. That is if I exercise. And I'm a, I'm a karate athlete. Okay, so, now, so sometimes okay. when it comes to kicking, I can't kick higher like before. So what I would suggest is, funny, uh, before getting into sort of uh, specific karate exercises, I would I would recommend that you engage mostly in uh, hip mobility exercises and also hip strengthening exercises hip flexibility exercises before getting back into active karate. Uh, you need to strengthen that particular joint before going back. So, because um, again, if we go back too soon, it might uh, make our condition worse and we'll find ourselves being injured again. Okay, thank you. Karibu. Belinda, you had your hands up. You still have anything to add or? All right. If there's no any more concern, uh, let me take this opportunity to thank Elvis for availing yourself and uh, presenting to us. Uh, we really enjoyed, we learned a lot. And I believe uh, uh, other fellow coaches have also learned. And uh, of course, you gave in a very good information that you can come to at KU to do some of these tests. It's important that uh, coaches know that fitness, baseline fitness and health tests are very important and key in terms of sports performance. Otherwise, thank you so much. And uh, we will welcome you again next time to if you're still willing to present, we will, we will welcome you again next time. Thank you so much.